Oh goodness, it got quiet all of a sudden. <laughs> that must mean it's time to get our show started. Happy Astronomy Days, everyone! <laughs> you have made it to one of the most exciting festivals that we host here at the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences. It's two days of all things space astronomy, astrophysics, and even more happening right here in downtown Raleigh. My name is Chris Smith. I work here at the museum as the coordinator for current science programs. That means that I get the special uh, pleasure and privilege of welcoming you all to Astronomy Days and to our very special guest presentations. Uh, for this program, we've got just one of the best guests for Astronomy Days this year that I can imagine having, NASA astronaut Christina Cook. You're going to be meeting Christina in just a moment. Uh, but first, there's just a little housekeeping thing. Um, I got a note from the front desk. Whoever parked the Artemis rocket and the Orion spacecraft on the roof, your lights are on. Uh, I appreciate y'all laughing at that. That was, thank you. Oh my goodness. Well. Make sure that you check out the rest of today's presentations, games, crafts, activities. There's a lot to see and do here at the Museum of Natural Sciences for Astronomy Days today and tomorrow. Since I have your attention, I also want to throw out a small plug for the Museum of History that is just across the plaza from us. They're celebrating the African American cultural celebration. So it's a great two days to be in downtown Raleigh and participate in all of the great stuff that is coming out of the Department of Natural and Cultural Resources and your free state museums. Now, to get the show started, I want you to meet one other special guest, the head of the Astronomy Research Lab and Astrophysics Research here at the Museum of Natural Sciences is Dr. Rachel Smith, and Dr. Smith is going to start our program. Everyone, and I'll be really fast because I know you're here to see our wonderful astronaut. So uh, welcome. Thank you for coming. It's really great to be in person. I'm so excited. Um, and I'm really excited to, yes, in person. Yay. And I'm really excited to introduce Christina Cook, who I've never met and is so amazing and just so awesome in so many ways. So uh, just really, she's going to tell you about her amazing achievements, and um, she's here, so you don't need to hear from me. But I just want to say she um, she has set a record. She's been to space, and she sent a, she set a record for the longest single space flight by a woman with a total of 328 days in space, from March 14, 2019, to February 6. And. She conducted six spacewalks, including the first three all-women spacewalks, uh, totaling 42 hours and 15 minutes. And she is from North Carolina. She's from Jacksonville. Woo! She's in uh, North Carolina School of Science and Mathematics alum and NC State. And so please give a warm welcome for Christina Cook. And just remember, I just want to say we have an anniversary of Apollo, and all, all men have been to the moon, only men. And Christina has been named as part of this, of the Artemis cadre, to go back to the moon as the, hopefully the first woman to go to the moon. But who knows? But it's really ex an exciting time, 50 years. So way to go. <laughs> and just to commemorate this visit, if you just entertain, we're going to take a quick selfie with all you guys in the background. So. Take it away. Wow, thank you guys so much for that warm welcome. I do not feel worthy. It is a total honor, privilege, and delight to be back in North Carolina to be with you guys again. And I'm so glad my nephew, Evan, is happy to be here too. Hey, buddy. Um, so 
I was here seven years ago when you guys were kind enough to invite me back then, and at the time I was in training. I was doing the astronaut candidate training program, and the story I told back then was all about my journey, which started in North Carolina here, and led to this dream that I never even thought um, was achievable that I had had since I was a little girl here to become an astronaut. Just, I'm just curious, was anyone here seven years ago and saw that? Okay, well I thought maybe, all right, I see some. I thought maybe not everyone, so we're gonna do a little what you missed preview. And I've got the actual <laughs> slides because what I wanna talk about today is space, my journey to space, what it's really like to be in space and some of the thoughts coming away from that. So I didn't wanna spend too much time going over the early stuff, but to give you a little bit of a preview because of course, any, <laughs> any trip to space, <laughs> <laughs> starts with a lot of hard work and a big journey. So I didn't want to gloss over it. It was a, a long road, a lot of challenges. So we're going to do a quick preview of all that. So as you guys know, I loved things that made me feel small growing up. The night sky. I wanted to be a national my whole life. Worked at NASA. Pursued hobbies that got me out of my comfort zone. Went to Antarctica. Loved the auroras. Worked hard doing rock climbing, which I started at NC State. Saw something I launched into space, I made launch into space. Kept working in really remote places all over the world, including eventually the tropics. And then landed an interview at NASA from Samoa, where I was working at the time. Found myself in this group. Started lots of training, learning how to fly. learning how to do spacewalks, learning the space station systems, because my destination would eventually be the space station, learning how to be the space plumber and fix the space toilet, <laughs> and how to actually do a spacewalk, which was another amazing dream that I could never imagine would actually come true, learning geology, how to do the robotics, how to do the science, and eventually being a part of a cadre of assignable astronauts. But what I wanted to do with the remaining time is to really deep dive into some things that I get a lot of questions about and, and make you all feel some of these things and what it, they're really like. But before we go and do that, I did want to take a moment and acknowledge that this is actually the anniversary of one of NASA's first acts or main accidents. There was an Apollo 1 accident earlier, but this is the today is the 37th anniversary of the Challenger accident. And actually, in a couple days on February 1st will be the 20th anniversary of Columbia. So I wanted to acknowledge not only this crew, but really, I think what struck me this year about this is anyone who makes sacrifices for something they believe in. This crew, like, like myself, we believe in exploration and um, we're willing to make sacrifices and take risks for that. But that's not the only thing people give up things for. In this area in particular, people gave up a lot when they were fighting for the civil rights movement and other things that are important. So I want to acknowledge that today. So as I said, like this crew, our crew had a mission that we wanted to fill that we fulfill that we believed in. And one of the sort of most difficult or challenging, huge things that we do is spacewalks. And the question I get a lot is, what's it really like to be out on a spacewalk? So I want to tell you guys a lot more about that today. Um, in this picture, you can see that's Jessica and I getting ready for our first spacewalk and the rest of the crew on board the space station, our buddies Luca and Drew who suited us up and the Russian commanders, um, Oleg and, and Alexei back there. And then this is our airlock. So in a minute, you'll see what it feels like to be in the airlock. And when you, you can tell, these suits are gigantic. So when you put two of these suits in there along with all the other equipment that we have, the, it's not exactly a calm way to start your day. Oh, I'll get to that picture in a minute. First, I'm gonna just orient you. So this is the space station. And as you, so these modules here that look like soda cans, that's actually where we live during the day. But when we have to do something outside on the space station, we go out what's called an airlock. An airlock is a tiny little space with one door that goes to the space station, one door that goes out to space. You stuff the people in the spacesuits in there, you pump out all of the air, and then you open that door out into the open space and you start to crawl around on the outside of this. The airlock is actually right around here. And where I did most of my work was way about 
right about here. It was the farthest you could get. There's a whole other solar array that's about right here. And uh, you'll see we were working way out here. Um, and so you hop into that airlock. Our spacewalks can be up to seven hours long or longer. Um, and this is how you start. You're completely packed in there. Remember those Skittles that you saw in the movie? You're basically like that. You're in there, and except there's way more Skittles and not enough space. And you are so happy when it's time to actually go out the hatch. Um, and I will tell you, this is the first time and only time in my space entire mission that I actually noticed I was scared. When I looked down the first time after my buddy opened this hatch, at the time of my first spacewalk, it was completely nighttime outside. And I looked down underneath my feet and I saw this gaping black hole that I had to go out of in a couple seconds and my heart rate shot through the roof immediately, completely automatic reaction. And I immediately you know, got it under control and got back to the business. But that was the first and only time in my whole mission where I actually had a physiological reaction of fear. And of course, we're trained to turn that into focus and our training really took over and everything was fine. So you head out the door, and then you reach up to start your journey. This is right outside the airlock. That's a picture of Jessica that I took. And then, if it's light out, you notice something that's very strange. And that is the image of your own boots looking down and seeing the earth below them, 250 miles below, screaming by. So in this picture, you can't tell, but we're flying so fast. All this is moving and you see the earth going by below your boots. So imagine this person looking down and seeing that scene. And this is right on the other side of the airlock. So this is the first thing you see when you come up. In my first spacewalk, the first thing I had to do was crawl over to this platform and then around to the front of it, which actually kind of hangs off. It's a platform of spares. And I found myself here just a few minutes after coming out. <laughs> and I had to put down my tether let go <laughs> and grab my drill, which let me tell you is an act of faith, especially again when you look down and you see that earth moving by and nothing but your boots below you. The majority of the spacewalk, you're just working on your tasks. You're so focused on what you have to do, you don't even think about it. We have a tool stand, like basically a little mini workstation of tools right on the front of us, which makes it a little hard to work because it's taken up so much space. And you can also see how awkward it is to reach things. This is me trying to give Van, uh, Jessica this box, and I can barely reach um, the arm span because of the way that the spacesuit is designed. So luckily, the future spacesuits of the Moon program are going to be a little better in that regard. Um, so I wanted to tell you a little bit about the views and my favorite view while on a spacewalk. So if you can imagine this person, there's actually a spacewalker here. What do they see when they look down towards Earth? You see this solar array? They have a view like this. And the one time that I was lucky enough to ride on the robotic arm, I ended up in a spot that was right on top of a solar array, and I had this view. And it felt like I was looking down a skyscraper with the earth in the background. It was phenomenal. But every 45 minutes in the space station, we have a nighttime. That's because we're going around the earth every hour and a half. And so what is it like on a spacewalk at night? Well, you have your helmet lights, but that's all you have. So suddenly, this ability to orient yourself, since you can't tell which way is up and down just by the feel of it, there's no gravity. All that goes away. All you see is the line of your safety tether going out into darkness and what's in front of you, and that is it. Now, I had a really awesome experience where my helmet lights actually became disconnected in the middle of a spacewalk. And we t the ground team w wasn't sure what to do. There was talk of canceling the spacewalk, heading back, and they asked me, Christina, are you, are you comfortable to continue without lights? And <laughs> I said, yes, I am. So we finished the spacewalk, and it turned out to be the coolest experience I had because I didn't have those lights. And during those night passes, when I looked out, I could see with my eyes, not through a window, through my space visor, the lights of the Earth going down below. And I could look out, and I could see the stars. And to have that vision when you're out there in the open space was truly incredible and one that I normally would have never had to been able to do. 
So this is how dark it is in those instances. And you can imagine I was staying very close to my buddy when I lost my lights <laughs> because I didn't want to lose all chance of seeing. Um, but luckily, we have people on the ground that are guiding us through on our tasks, and they can help keep track of us if we get off path. But as you, as you can imagine, that's also why you're happy when it's over, to come back and see your friends, the familiar faces, and to know you are tired, you've worked really hard for the last seven hours, and you're back, and that is the best hot chocolate you can imagine. <laughs> so... I want to shift gears a little bit because the video went into life on board the space station a little bit, but not really into what we do for fun. And just to talk about life on board, I love this picture because it shows how closely we work. This is me working in a, a scientific glove box on the ceiling right next to my buddy Nick while he is working out um, on the space bicycle, essentially. And so we are always really close quarters, but we have free time too. And one of my favorite things to do in my free time was to read by the window. But my ultimate favorite thing was taking pictures out the window of the cupola of the earth. I, as you saw from some of my Antarctic stuff, I love auroras and my dream was to see them from above on a planetary scale. And it was truly amazing. But today I want to tell you about the coolest thing I ever saw out the window of the cupola. And I'm actually going to let you guys see it too, hopefully in the same way that I did. So what I'd like, um, we were, it was a day when we were, multiple people were in the cupola. We were all watching the Earth. We were about to go over the U.S., and so we were excited to see it. This is about a month into my mission. So show of hands only when we get to the next slide. Don't shout it out, but when you recognize what you see, Raise your hand on the next slide. Anybody? It's hard to tell, isn't it? You guys got it? That's you guys. <laughs> That's our home. That's North Carolina. And the first time I saw it coming over the horizon, I didn't know it was gonna appear in front of me like that. And this was it, my home, the earth. And as someone, I'm from Jacksonville, so it's near the coast, and I was so used to every time I saw a map of North Carolina, knowing how to find my home, I would follow the coastline, the outer banks, and then go down here and look for where the new river inlet was. It was like the, the one landmark I could find. And to see that landmark on the earth from space was absolutely incredible. I took a couple <laughs> I took a couple other pictures of North Carolina. This is one directly from above of the Outer Banks, and then one of my favorite places in the whole planet, Cape Lookout. Oh, you guys love it too. I know. It's beautiful. Awesome. And then moving a little bit west and looking towards the east, this is another view of our beautiful Outer Banks. You can't see the sound as easily, but it's all in here. Now I'm going to move us even farther west, and we're going to be looking out east. So it's harder to see, but this is what, this is what you have to figure out when you're in space. These, these are the Outer Banks out here. This is the Atlantic. We're looking from the west east, and... Where are we? Right there. So when you, yeah, you can use Google Earth and figure out all this stuff. And I think this is like the highway, like from Charlotte to Raleigh area. It's pretty cool. And then one more view directly above of the Raleigh area. So um, I couldn't remember it, but I figured someone would. Does anyone recognize this lake? Which lake is that? So this is just to orient you. This is like RDU right here. This is Raleigh. This is Durham, Chapel Hill. What lake is that? Okay, I heard Car Lake, Falls Lake, okay, it's debatable. It's hard to tell, isn't it? But I'm going to zoom in. Now you can see, yeah, it was really zoomed in, um, RDU, and we are sitting here right here, right about here. So thank you. Oh, yeah, you can even see like uh, 540, 40, yeah, all the highways. Umstead Park, which I'm going after this. Um, so 
that's my mission, and I wanted to tell you, though, I have one more thing to share, and that is, of all the things I trained on, all the things I learned, all the things that we had to do as a team, there was one thing that stood out the most, and that is the absolute most important thing when you're doing something with a group of people that matters, and that is kindness. This is my crew, and we absolutely always showed each other kindness, empathy, humility. We had to ask for help a lot from each other, and we always treated each other with absolute kindness, and honestly, that is what made us successful. We trusted each other, we were able to let each other know when we needed something, and to accomplish the mission together. So my mission was on the ISS, but what is NASA doing next? Well, instead of sending people via the Soyuz, now we actually send people on commercial rockets. One is a SpaceX rocket, and inside this capsule right here, there's a crew of four. We're about to launch another crew in about a month. We have another commercial carrier, an American company, Boeing, that's gonna be sending people later this year. But most exciting, while we've turned over that sector to industry and really grown a space industry, we are now going even further. We're going back to the moon. And the idea is to take the lessons we learned there and go to Mars. And the name of this mission is Artemis. We have the Orion spacecraft, as you can see there, which is the actual capsule that will go to the moon. And we have the SLS rocket. We, which took off last November, if anyone was paying attention, and had some absolutely stunning photos. So, does anyone know what that is? What's that crescent? That's right, that's Earth. That's right, Evan, it is Earth, yes! And it was so awesome to see that view again from Earth, from a human-rated spacecraft. It was uncrewed, but the next time we send it, it's gonna have crew aboard. Just some more phenomenal pictures it took, both of ourselves and the moon. And I always say, the reason we explore isn't to learn about where we're going, it's to learn about ourselves. And eventually we'll be on the surface of the moon doing work with the robotics there, and then eventually, taking everything we learned to Mars. And there's where I think we'll answer one of the most important philosophical questions of our time, which is, are we alone? Thank you so much for your time. I, I hope I left time for questions. Christina, thank you very much. Incredible stuff. Don't you agree, obviously. So. You're in luck. We have time for questions from you. So if you have a question, uh, raise your hand. I'll actually bring a microphone. I'm sure we won't get to all of them. I'll get to as many as we can. Uh, but I'll bring you a microphone. For folks who are watching on our YouTube live stream, thank you for tuning in. Uh, there is going to be a chunk that was at the beginning of the presentation that will not be in the archived version of this talk. So uh, just so you know, when there's a gap, don't worry. Stay with it. Uh, but now I'm... Hold your question until I get a microphone to you. Because we have the virtual audience, we want to make sure that everyone in the room and watching at home can hear. And I'm going to come, where, show of hands, I'm just going to start here on the front row. Where and how do you sleep in space? Was that sleep? Yeah. Oh my gosh, it's like you're a plant. I have an awesome video to show you. Um, so, sleeping in space is amazing and you actually get to just zip yourself up in a sleeping bag, but I'm gonna show you why. So I sped this up, and so I'm gonna narrate over it. I'm explaining things very, very uh, enthusiastically in the video, but I'll be talking over it here. This is why you can't sleep like normal in space. It doesn't work. You can try, but it doesn't work. And man, sometimes you just wanna plop down in a bed, but you can't. So we have sleeping bags that are attached to the wall and we have a little bedroom. So this is me in my space bedroom. I got a little computer and my sleeping bag. So every night what you do is you zip yourself up in your sleeping bag so that you don't float away. And it is the most comfortable sleep ever because there's no hot spots. You don't have to toss and turn. You just float there really peacefully. And we even have an arm holes in the sleeping bag so you can sleep like a zombie. <laughs> it's the best. Is it relaxing just floating 
in space. It's very relaxing to float in space. It's an amazing feeling. And, you know, since you asked about floating, you're actually really just in a giant free fall, falling around the earth the whole time, and everything around you is falling too, so it feels like you're floating. Do you have a question in here? Um, what, what does it feel like going up and down, like going up to space? In space? the rocket? Yeah. It's an amazing feeling. Um, I think I explained it a little bit during the video, but it's like going up in a roller coaster, except it doesn't stop. You just keep going up and it keeps getting faster and faster and faster and you're laying kind of back so you feel the acceleration in your chest and it gets up to three to four g's so three to four times as heavy as you feel on earth you feel as you're in your chair and then the rocket is staged so the first stage stops and you kind of pop out of your seat and then you really hope that second stage turns on and it does and you keep go you go more so there's a couple stages but yeah and then at the end that third stage cuts off and you just float right out of your, you know, just to the edge of, of where your seat belts are, and that's when you know you're in space. When you, when you exercise, wouldn't you just flip forward? Yes, good question. So the reason, I have another slide for this too, but it might be too hard to get to it. But um, the reason that when we exercise, we have a treadmill. Do you guys know what, the kiddos know what a treadmill is? You run on it, but we can't just run on a treadmill because we would just fly right off. We actually have to wear a harness and be bolted down or bungee down to the outsides of the treadmill so that we can run. Let me see if I can find a picture for you because I do have one. We're gonna keep going, that's another video, more of these. This is the, the harness system that you have to use to go running in space. Great question. What does it feel like to do flips in space? It feels really fun. Um, the crazy thing is you don't feel like you have a head rush like you do on Earth when you're upside down. Um, it just kind of feels like when you're upside down, you don't feel any different than when you're right side up. So that's the weirdest thing about it, I would say. You guys do flips in the pool, and you can kind of tell when you're upside down, right? Not in space. It just all feels the same. Did you ever find any challenges with being a woman in a very male-dominated field? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, honestly, at NC State, I studied physics and electrical engineering. So I started right out in a very male-dominated field, and then I was a NASA engineer. So that was sort of a norm that I grew up with. And I think that it made me a very um, independent person. I did not really discover true teamwork until very much later in my career. And I think it's because I just felt like I had to prove myself all the time by being really, really good, by not exposing anything, anything that I didn't know or things that I wasn't sure of. And so I just worked really hard and was very independent. Um, so that was a big challenge. What's your favorite part about being an astronaut? Ooh. My favorite part is the teamwork. Um, when you have that crew and you're working together and your teams are on the ground, your teams are with you in space, and you all have a common mission that you love and that you're working toward, that is the best feeling ever. And that is the best part about being an astronaut. Did you see any other planets besides us? You know what? I did. I saw Jupiter and Saturn. But you know what's really wild? It's the same almost as what you all see from the surface of the Earth. Because we're only about 250 miles straight up, which actually isn't that far away from the surface of the Earth when you think about how big the solar system really is. But the difference is when we look out at the stars and the planets, we're not looking through the air and the atmosphere of the Earth. So everything we see is much more clear, it's much more bright, um, and so looking at Jupiter, I would grab the binoculars just like I love to do on Earth and check it out and see the four moons, but unfortunately haven't seen any close-up yet. How long do you sleep in space? Mm. Well, I really like to sleep. So I try to sleep the same as I do on Earth, which is about eight hours a night. Um, sometimes a little less if you're really busy, and on the weekends, if you're lucky, a little bit more. Uh, 
Um, so I don't know if you've uh, heard of this. I assume you have. D did you experience the overview effect? Um, because I recently read about William Shatner's trip to space, and he obviously did. It was kind of bleak, according to him. And I'm just curious to hear about like what your experience with that was. Yes. So the thing that he's referring to is there's this phenomenon that's been called the overview effect, which is how I, my take on it is how your perspective about your place in the universe and the, the world, the world, you know, how does that change when you see the earth from space? And for me, it definitely had a profound impact on me. I think instead of seeing all this as this absolute, I saw it as its place in a wider universe. I saw it as one of many options, one of many planets, one of many worlds. And it really just taught me to appreciate what we have. And that newfound sense that everything we know isn't absolute. It's kind of like that same feeling you get the first time you might travel abroad, if any of you have had the opportunity to do that. You suddenly realize, oh, everything I'm used to just happens to be what my experience is. There's many more experiences out there. How can I become an astronaut? Great question. Um, so I, I always, know too. yeah, I always tell people the most important thing is to do what you love to discover what you're passionate about and what you're good at and what makes you excited and to chase after that. That's number one. If you're not sure what that is, I like to go back to first principles. What life did you imagine for yourself when you were little, like you are right now? What do you dream about? And that's what you can go after. I also tell people to support one another. When we support each other, we get so much back and we contribute the most that we can to the world. And if you focus on that support of the people around you, you might find that you go farther than you ever would if you aren't focused on that. Um, and as, as it may not sound as directly applicable, but kind, kindness and empathy will actually probably do the most to get you on the path to becoming an astronaut as long as you're studying that engineering, science, or math as well. How do you go to the bathroom in space? Wow, another plant. Let's go back to that potty picture. So this is the space bathroom. And um, basically, since there's no gravity to pull things down where you would like them to go, they have to use a ventilation and a fan system. So for urination, you basically just use a tube and a funnel, and then this is the actual space toilet. This opens up, there's a little bag in there that collects it, it all gets collected there. When it's full, we cap it off really good, we put it in that trash vehicle, and remember that that picture of the vehicle zooming away and going to burn up in the Earth's atmosphere, that's what happens to it. So how could you make the plants grow? Yes, so the plants actually, it's a great question. We weren't sure, will plants grow in microgravity? Do they need the signal of gravity to do their thing? Or does the water need the gravity to actually flow down to the roots? And it turns out we're able to give the plants everything that they need to grow. We use a little light um, with all of the right, you know, spectrum of light so that they can get everything that they need for photosynthesis. And we have the roots in a little basically like a packet so that all the water stays in there and we use a syringe and a tube to inject the water into that packet in just the right amount and it turns out the plants can grow mostly like they grow down on earth so it's pretty great and I think the next experiment is actually going to grow tomatoes which is really cool I think I need to go back to space so I can eat some space tomatoes did you have to go and come down in a wheelchair Great question. When I first came back, my body had forgotten how to walk. I actually couldn't walk right away because my brain had adjusted to not having gravity. I hadn't actually walked on under my own control for almost a year, for almost 11 months. And so that was really tough to learn. It sort of comes back quickly though. So you see they put you in a little chair and they carry you around for maybe your first hour or so in your back. And then they let you try to learn to walk. And so it wasn't too long before I was walking with a couple people on each side to make sure I didn't fall over. <laughs> Did you float when you come back? 
Wow. Unfortunately, after you come back, you don't get to float anymore. I think that's why astronauts always want to go back to space, so they can float again. Because once you're back, you're back in Earth's gravity, so you don't have that ability to float. But I remember the last time I floated and when I strapped myself into the rocket to come home, and I really thought about that. I wanted to remember the feeling. What first ever inspired you to become an astronaut? That's a really good question, and the answer is I'm not 100% sure. I don't remember a time when I didn't want to be an astronaut. I know that I was inspired by anything that made me feel small. I loved looking at the night sky, I loved the ocean, and I just loved pondering the size of the universe, our place in the universe, and I think that made me want to explore. And eventually I found out I loved science and math, and so it all sort of just fit together. Did you see Germany on Earth? Did you see Germany? I did see Germany. Yes, I have friends that live in Germany, so I took a lot of pictures of Germany. And what's really neat is every single continent has its own kind of signature that you can see from space. And it really goes to show how, how we organize ourselves as a culture is visible from the outside of our planet. I could look at a little square spot on any continent and tell you what continent it was, not needing to even see the outlines or what it looked like, just by how the neighborhoods and towns were organized. And um, Germany and a lot of the European cities, you could tell that they were older than the US cities because oftentimes they were organized around like a center around a bend in a river or something like that and the way that they um, had you know, roads and spokes and things like that. So Germany was beautiful. What were holidays like in space? Holidays were so much fun in space. Um, I'm really lucky since I was there for 11 months, I got to spend almost every single holiday in space. And Christmas was one of my favorites because we took the whole day off and we actually turned off all the lights on the space station and we used our little flashlights with some yellow tape over the ends to make like fake candles and we put them all over the space station and we just spent the whole day in a candlelit world and it was the one day that I felt like I was someplace else when I was on board. It was really special. Folks, and we gave let's presents. Let's give NASA astronaut Christina Cook one more round of applause.